Good morning. I am. I hate to interrupt all that wonderful fellowship, and, uh, but I will. Nothing else to see to work, so maybe just maybe I can do it. Uh, it is so good to see all of you this morning, and uh, and to hear to hear. I start to say to hear your smiling faces. That's actually a true thing. You sound different when you smile, and it's good to hear that. We are in our third week of our series called Rule of Faith, where we're looking at uh, a rule that we can establish um, based on the based on the idea of uh, uh, Benedict uh, that that created that. Actually, he's the guy that kind of created the whole idea of monastic life, and he had this rule of life that that ruled over every. Monastery, like it's how they lived life. Um, and, and we talked about this idea that rules are like a trellis. That's where the word rule comes from, the Latin word regula. It means trellis that lifts up branches and vines off the ground, protects them, supports them. And that's how what rules should be to us. Not restrictive, not things that bind us, but boundaries that kind of help us, support us, cause us to grow, cause us to be fruitful. And so in doing that, we are looking at um, uh, the book of James and and James gives us a great rule of life in so many areas. We looked at uh, joy, and uh, last week looked at freedom. And today, we're going to look at the idea of faith, the rule of faith. The rule of faith. I guess I've been focused a lot on Israel here, as we all are, and it's kind of hard. And, and, and I'm, I'm reminded of visits I've made to, to synagogues and stuff when I was studying worship and those kind of things in school. And, one of the things that, that stuck out to me that, that uh, it is important when talking about faith is th there's a, a prayer that is prayed in Judaism called the Shema. And it is probably the, the most central affirmation of Judaism there is. It's, it's traditionally prayed twice a day, morning services and evening services. And the, the prayer, the Shema prayer is named that because it's named after the first word. And, and that, that Hebrew word Shema um, which if you, if you see it written out, uh, it, it's one of those Hebrew words, if you see it out written, like the transliteration in English, it's just S-M. And with some little accents. And so you have to fill in the vowels, and it's, but it, it sounds like Shema. And so that prayer is, is based on Deuteronomy 6, uh, 4 through 9, Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 21, and Numbers 15, 37 through 41. And all of those passages form this prayer. Deuteronomy 6.4, it, it, it starts with the Hebrew word Shema, and it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord God is one. And, and, and that prayer is, and is prayed in its instructions on what to do with that. It's the most central affirmation of their faith. We believe in the one true God. Um, but that word literally means to listen, sometimes in there you hear translated hear, but it also means to heed. To, to the best definition of it is to hear and do. There is no concept in, in, in the Hebrew of ever just hearing something and not acting on it. That's, that's, that would be a foreign idea. The idea of Shema is to hear and do. Hear and obey. Listen and obey. There is no... But some of you parents need to write that down and make sure you, you need to enact a, a Shema principle in your house. Hear means to do. And there is no, you know, uh, there is no hear without do. I, the spirit of Yoda just took over me there. There is no, there is no hear. Well, there is hear and do. Okay, so I, I'm trying to squeeze. That doesn't work. But here's the thing, when we look at the book of James, and we talked about this both in the last couple of weeks, we talked about, you know, that, that verse in the first chapter, James 1.22, I, I don't have it on the screen, but it, it's, it's that verse where James says to be hearers of the word and not doers is not, it doesn't work, he's saying. You've got to be doers of the word, not just hearers. It, understand, and you remember we talked about in the very first verse of James, James is writing to uh, Jewish people, all that have scattered all over the world. The diaspora, as it's known. And, it, and he's writing to these Jewish believers. 
So understand something. James is not introducing new theology to them, some new idea. When he says you've got to be doers of the word, not just hearers, he's actually reminding them of their training. He's reminding them of the Shema. He's reminding them of what it is they believe. He's saying, listen, we listen to Jesus. We follow him now. He's Messiah. We get that because he's writing to the Jewish believers. But don't forget those Jewish principles still exist. So just like the Shema meant to hear and obey, hear and do, he's reminding them. He's not introducing something new. He's saying, hey, hey, you forgot. You can't just listen to what Jesus said and walk away thinking, oh, that was beautiful. That was wonderful. You've got to do what he says. You've got to obey. That's an expectation. So in chapter 2, he addresses this idea of faith. And he starts this in verse 14 of chapter 2. This is what James says. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works. Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Now, I love this. I love, I love James. I love the way James says that. We talked in the week one about how James is kind of a straight shooter. He just says it like you believe it. And I love this passage. Because he's saying, listen, you say you have faith, you say you believe, but what good is it if somebody says to you, he says you run into a brother or sister, somebody in the faith that's, that's, that doesn't have enough clothes, they're cold, they're hungry, and you say to them, hey, brother, how you doing? And you be well, stay warm, be fed, and you'll walk away and don't do anything. He's saying, what good is that? There's one translation that actually says it this way. That kind of faith doesn't save. Now, before we get too far, I want to make sure we understand James. I just want to take a second and let's just try to get an understanding of James for a second. Because if we're not careful here, we can almost feel like that he's contradicting almost every one of Paul's letters. Uh, more importantly, he's contradicting the message Victor preached back in January called Faith Alone. I don't think James was concerned with that, but um, <laughs> some of you just got that. I don't think James is like, oh, one day Victor Morris is going to preach on faith and I'm going to contradict everything he said. <laughs> Listen, there's two things I want us to make sure we know about James and this passage especially. Here's the first one. If you want to start filling in blanks, here you go. This passage is not a contrast of faith and works. James is not contrasting faith and works. He's not saying, hey, there's faith and there's works, and you should have, you say you have faith, I say you should have work. He's not doing that, okay? Uh, if, he, if he was doing that, he would be contradicting a couple of things, like the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 4, 5. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives them. And Paul makes it very clear. You're not saved because of anything you can do. In Ephesians, he writes to the church in Ephesus, chapter 2, verses 8. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Paul is making it very clear. This is where Victor correctly got his message from back in January. We do, we do believe in faith alone. That's all that's required, faith alone, faith in God alone. There is nothing you can do to earn God's grace. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. There is nothing, if somebody says, hey, you could be saved if you wanna make sure a Christian, make sure you do this, this, and this, and this, just walk away. That's not how it works. It is by grace through faith we are saved. So then, okay, James isn't contradicting, he's not contrasting. What is he doing? Here's the second thing to understand about James. It is a contrast of true faith and false faith. He's not contrasting faith and works. He's saying there's false faith that's empty that looks at that brother and says, hey, how you doing? Good. Hey, make sure you stay warm. Eat well and then don't give them close food. And he's saying that's false faith. Real faith 
as works as something that comes along with it. Uh, much like his definition in chapter 1 when he said pure religion, James doesn't contrast, doesn't say religion is bad. He says there is a good, pure religion, and that is when we take care of those less fortunate. We take care of the orphans and widows. That's pure religion. He's trying to identify a faith here in chapter 2 that is true, that is real. And he's saying true faith is more than just believing by mental assent, by just saying, yeah, I believe that. It's got to produce something. Now, I might say this several times today. I haven't decided yet. I, I was trying to find a place to put it in, and it works everywhere. So I'm going to repeat it over and over again. Apparently, it's something God wants you to hear and get, because I might repeat this one. Faith does start here. You have to believe. You have to understand. You have to have a faith that believes. But at some point, faith for you to be saved, redeemed, transformed, faith has to move from here, from hearing God's word, to your heart. And it's got to become a heart thing where you believe not just in, but you believe on. This is an old example, but it still works to this day. Believing in is like you walking in the door and believing that that chair is not going to fall apart. Every one of you probably believed in. And every one of you right now is believing on because you're sitting in that chair. You're not just looking at it going, hmm. I think that's going to hold me. I think that's not going to fall apart when I sit on it. You know, I think that's possible. But the minute you actually sat down on it, you put works to your faith, and it moved from believing in to believing on. And then here, But here's how you know you believe on, when it moves to your hands and your feet, and it becomes action. And the minute you sat down, now I can see works I can see action that proves that it made it to your heart from your head. Does that make sense? So I look around this room and I can tell without a fact, without a shadow of a doubt, bless you, I, can, I, I, I know that you believe on these chairs. Why? Because I can see your heart. I, no, I can't see your heart. I can't, under, I can't see your faith in that chair until you sat down. And Monica, the minute you sat down, it's like, she believes on that chair. I see witness of that. Now I'm getting way ahead of myself. All right. Let's just for the next few minutes, if we can, I want to look at, I want to look at five faith facts. Say that three times real fast. Five faith facts. Now I was, I was talking to one of you this week and, and uh, it, was, it was Jeff after a small group at, at his house. And I was talking and talking and talking and my wife was calling and calling and calling and saying, where are you? And I was, I ignored it a couple of times and I tried to answer her and then, and, and she knew I was being foolish because she called and said, where are, are you still at Jeff's? I said, yes, they will not shut up. I'm trying to leave. And they just keep talking and talking and talking. You know, Jeff turned out three different lights at one point, um, uh, you know, and I just smiled because I knew what he was doing, but I just got on it. Okay, I'm going to wait till you make me leave. I'm just going to keep, and, uh. So in the midst of that conversation between, uh, let's see, between the time Nate left at about 8.30, 8.45 maybe, and the time I left at about 2.45, something like that, I don't remember, it was somewhere around the ballpark. I, I asked him, it was not three, it might have been three before you laid down, I was home before three, so don't say, don't give me that. Um, but in the midst of that conversation, I was, I was talking about, I was so excited because I'd been working on this and the, and, and if you, if Jeff knows, if you catch me at the end of the week and I'm excited about when we'll preach on Sunday, you're going to get the whole Jeff's, you can go ahead and sleep like you normally do, Jeff, because you, you, you already heard it. And so, uh, don't lay down, that'll hurt my feelings. Just <laughs> close your eyes and pretend you're praying like you normally do. Um, but I was telling Jeff how this happened because I wanted to, I had all these kind of things and I didn't know how to structure them. I thought, well, these are rules, these are faith rules. You know, we did that week one with rule, joy rules. You know, I said, oh, I have faith rules. But I didn't know how many there were going to be. And then when I got to the end, I thought, oh, there's five. Oh, there's five faith rules. Well, that didn't sound good. <laughs> and so I changed it to facts. So it's five faith facts. Okay. I was telling Nathan about that. And he said he knew I'm preparing some stuff for Romania. And he said, you know, you're not going to do that in Romania because the words aren't going to start with that. You know, you can't hear it. That's the one thing when you go overseas in a different language, the, the alliterations don't work. So, five faith facts. 
Here's what James says. He picks up in verse 17. So keep in mind, let's go back. He just finished saying in, in verse 14, what good is it if you do that? And he says, without giving them things they need, what good is that? And then verse 17. So faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It's useless. It doesn't work. So here's the first fact. Faith that saves is never alone. Faith that saves is never alone. Now, now let, me, let, me, let me put something on the front of it. You can scribble this in in front of that to make that sentence make sense. We are saved by faith alone. But faith that saves is never alone. Let me say that again. We are saved by faith alone. But faith that saves is never alone. It's never by itself. It's always got something. We are saved by grace alone through faith. But James is telling us here that real faith that saves will always be accompanied by action, by works, by something, by something that can be seen. It's, it's going to be that way. It's going to be that way. I, I, I'm, I'm often, and I, I know that there's a, a lot of great debate, in, especially in the body of Christ and, and, and amongst the secular world that doesn't know Scripture but likes to throw Scripture out, especially to... Uh, especially this one, I love this one, when somebody who doesn't follow Christ, doesn't do this, will be quick to tell you not to judge. You know, your Bible says not to judge, and it's first, first of all, it doesn't actually say that. It says, you will be judged in the manner that you judge. And there are, you shouldn't judge, and I'm real quick to say, oh, I don't judge anybody. God does that. However, we are called to, to actually Make, you can make an assessment with things. I mean, Jesus did it a lot. If you follow the example of Jesus, I'm pretty sure that fig tree that to this day is withered up and dead feels like Jesus judged it. And there's a reason for that, because he judged it. You say, well, that was Jesus. Well, it was Jesus. And it's like, okay, we won't argue about who he was in that moment. But Jesus came along and there's a fig tree and it didn't have any fruit on it. And he said, well, what good is a tree if it doesn't produce fruit? And he cursed it. And when they came the next day, it was withered up and dead. God bless you. Have a great week. Um, <laughs> the point is this. We, we, we do look at stuff. And so I'll, I'll be honest with you. It's not a judgmental thing. But when somebody is quick to throw the label Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a, I'm a this and a that. And I see the actions of their life. And it's no different than before they were a Christian. There's a part of me that says, okay, Faith ought to have something with it. There's, there ought to be a change there. Now, here's where we get in trouble. We think that the minute somebody accepts Christ, they ought to look like us, act like us. You know? And that's, that's wrong. Okay? I, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that everybody that follows Jesus don't look just like me. Don't nod. Don't, don't do that. That's disrespectful. Don't. There's some places to aim in. That's not the place that. Listen to what James continues says. This is verse 18. He picks up chapter 2. Someone will say, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. In other words, they'll try to do this. Now here's James actually saying, I'm not contrasting the two. He's saying, some will say, well, you, you have faith, but I have works. And this is what James said. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my in other words, faith works should come out of faith. You believe, he says, verse 19, you believe that God is one. You do well. Okay? Now here, now keep in mind what we just talked about at the beginning. Who is he talking to? Jews. Jewish believers, right? And Jewish believers still practice Judaism. They were Messianic Jews, but they still followed the, the, their Jewish traditions. Most of them, they, they still went to the Son of God. They did those things, which means that every day, morning and evening, they probably prayed what? The Shema, okay, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God. The Lord is one. So James is actually making a subtle reference to them. He's reminding them of the Shema right here again. He says, you believe that God is one. That's good. You do well. And then here's how he follows it up. Even the demons believe. So guess what? The demons can pray the Shema. 
The demons believe that God is one. They know the truth. They know he's one. They believe in God, he says, and they shudder. They tremble. They know who he is and they're afraid of him. He says, you, you recite the Shema, but you have forgotten the meaning of the word. You have forgotten that it means to hear and do. To hear and do. So that leads us to the second faith fact. Here's the second one. Faith that doesn't work, doesn't work. Faith that doesn't work, doesn't work. It's got to have some actions with it. Listen, claiming an identity in Christ without any of the action that should follow that creates a false faith. In other words, it doesn't work. It's not a real faith. It's not a faith that continues, that goes on. Here's a third fact. Let's jump right to the third fact before we even get to the next verse. The evidence of faith is action. The evidence of faith is action. This is what James says in verse 20. He goes on. He says, do you want me? Now keep on, let's keep context here. He's talked about what faith is. It's without works. It doesn't work. It's useless. What good is it if you say to somebody this and it doesn't, you're not doing it, it doesn't work. Verse 19, he ends that up and says, even the, believe, even the demons believe that. Verse 20, this is what he says. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? In other words, he says, do you want the evidence? Do you want me to prove to you? Let me show you. I can show you. Let me, then I'll show you. And then, this is verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. And then he, he, he jumps to the end. I say to the end. Let's wait a minute. He says, verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, hold on, wait, wait, wait. I don't know if Paul was still living. I, 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 I don't know my, my, the, the times of this exactly. I'm not sure Paul ever read this letter by James. But if he did, he was going, James, what are you doing? You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? Now, I said a minute ago, I said it started at the beginning and went right to the end. I, 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 if you look at Hebrews chapter 11, which we know is the faith chapter. We talked about it a few weeks ago. Hebrews 11 talks about faith and it talks about by faith, it starts this almost several verses. By faith, Enoch walked with God. By faith, Noah built an ark and survived the flood. By faith, Sarah had Isaac, even though she was too old to have children. By faith, Joseph prayed and knew and, and saw the deliverance of his people. By faith, Moses, and then there's several verses about what Moses did. Every one of those stories. And then at the end, it says, by faith, it starts with Abraham, or Enoch, and then he mentions Abraham. And then at the end, he talks about Rahab, and then others that aren't named. James kind of picks a couple of those out. He talks about Abraham and Rahab. But in chapter 11 of, of Hebrews, when it's talking about faith, it, every one of those starts by faith, and then it tells you the action. Every time, by faith, they did this. By faith, they did this. By faith, they did. In other words, he's saying, James, uh, I don't know if James saw the book of Hebrews. There's still debate as to even who wrote the book of Hebrews. But it's almost like he's referring back to that passage. And he's saying, listen, don't you understand that, that they were not truly justified by faith alone? In the sense that faith has got to see works. True faith has got to be see works. Now, here's something important to understand. When he says faith apart from works is useless, in the second part of verse 20 there, that word faith is actually different than in some other places. That word faith is the Greek word pistis. Pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S. And it means not just to believe in. It means, the better definition is faithfulness, trustworthiness, assurance. So what James is saying here is 
the kind of continuing, ongoing, persevering faith that saves, that makes it to the end, is going to have some, is going to produce something. It's going to produce, it's going to be more than just a belief. It's going to be something different. It's going to transform. It's going to change. It's going to have fruit. It's going to produce So faith that saves is never alone. Faith that doesn't work, doesn't work. The evidence of faith is action. And then number four, faith with obedience will last. So what James is saying, this kind of faith is going to last because it includes obedience. Every one of those people that are mentioned in Hebrews 11, there's a, an element of obedience in what they did. Enoch did this. Abel did this. Noah built the ark. There's action that involves obeying what God, they, they understood Shema. They listened and obeyed. Faith with obedience will last. We talked about Paul and James. Let's go to Jesus for a minute because Jesus actually dealt with this. Towards the end of that Sermon on the Mount, uh, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, this is what Jesus said. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them. Everyone who hears these words and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Some of you, some of you, who grew up in like Sunday school, kids, church, whatever you call it at the time, right now, are, you're already you ahead of me. You, because when I got to the rains fell, you were going, the rains came down. Because uh, there, there's a song that I, I learned this verse before I ever learned this verse. Because when I was little, I used to sing, the wise man builds his house upon the rock. The wise man builds his house upon the rock. Y'all know that one? Yeah. You're so deprived. I'm poor children. <laughs> I'm going to talk to Eric. I might come to chapel sometime. When I get back in the country in a couple weeks, I'm gonna, we're going to have to learn this one. The wise man built... Don't shake your head. Kieran's going, no. <laughs> the wise man built his house upon the rock and the, and the rain came tumbling down. Verse 25. The rain came down and the floods came up. The rain came down and the floods came up. The rain came down and the floods came up and the house on the rock stood. What was it? Firm. Firm, right. Some of you tried to say strong and then switched it to firm and you said stern and I thought, I don't know that. Wait a second. Firm. Then there's a second verse. Jesus said in verse 26, everyone who hears the words of mine, these words of mine, and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish, yeah. the foolish man built his house upon the sand and the rains came down, rain came down, rains came down, floods came up, rain came down, floods came up, rain came down and the floods came up and the house on the sand fell flat. Jesus is not just giving a good construction lesson here. And it, it works. That's true. You need to build on a solid foundation or it's going to fall flat. Okay. But what he's saying here is uh, Jesus is actually telling us a faith that will endure to the end is simple as Shema. Listen and obey. Listen and obey. Faith starts here. Hear these words of mine, Jesus said, and it gets to your heart and it transforms you and it gets to your hands and your feet and now you're obeying his word. And when you do that, that kind of faith can, will continue, it will last. So faith that saves is never alone. It's gonna have some works. Faith that doesn't work, doesn't work. The evidence of faith is action. Faith with obedience will last. Here's the fifth fact. Faith should always be prophetic. 
Faith should always be prophetic. Now, I saw this statement, something similar to this, and I thought, hmm, huh? mm -hmm. okay. Because, like many of you, I suspect, we have narrowed down what it means to be prophetic, to, be, to, to prophesy, to, to, to exist in the realm of prophecy. We kind of, we've got prophecy kind of narrowed so far down that prophecy just is when, like, depending on your background, prophecy is either like is Isaiah, and it is, when he says Messiah is coming, you know, by his stripes we are healed. He, he gives all this wonderful information about Jesus way back when. He tells the future, he prophesies, or when Daniel or, or Joseph interprets a dream for somebody and says this is what it means, that's prophecy. Uh, or or uh, I'm sure you've seen possibly maybe one or two posts in the last week about Israel in this war and what it might mean prophetically. Oh, this is prophecy. All of those things are true. But prophecy is so much more than just that, than just telling the future. That, I mean, it is those things. And those things are wonderful. Sometimes it's not even the future. Sometimes, I mean, some of you have experienced prophecy standing right here in our spring revival. When, when G, I know Jerry has looked at a couple of you and said, you know what? God wants you to do such and such and such. And it's like, boom, you know it's from God and it's something you've been praying about and wrestling with and there's no way he could have known it. And God has spoken to him and he'd share something with you that only God could know. That's prophecy. But prophecy is not just that. When we talk about prophecy, there's one big book that's highly prophetic and that's the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, it is really, I like the full title of it. It is, it is the revelation of Christ given to John. So John is the one of disciple who is not martyred for his faith. Every, all the other disciples die like horrible deaths. We know Peter, they wanted to crucify him and he said, I am not worthy to be crucified. And so they crucified him upside down. We know that there were others that were that were killed in just, just horrible ways. I don't get into all the gory details, but, but, but when they were martyred, it was not simple. Like John, John was the only one who didn't die a horrible death. However, he was also boiled in oil several times. He was beaten within an inch of his life several times. And John went through a lot. And, and to be honest with you, John, John is known as the disciple that Jesus loved. Now, John is the one that gave himself that nickname, so I don't know if that counts. You're not supposed to give yourself your own nickname, but that's, John did that. He said, he's the, he's the beloved, John the beloved. And every time you hear that scene in scripture, it's John writing it. John says, I'm the love, I'm the beloved one. Uh, I also think it's wonderful that he tells about the resurrection and how they went to the tomb and Mary, you know, one, the ladies came and said, Jesus is risen, the tomb is empty. And he says that they raced to the tomb. Peter took off first. And then he makes the point to say, but John got there first. John's the one that says that, you know, he's like, make sure, not only am I love, I'm faster than Peter. <laughs> so John, I'll be honest with you, I've heard this, but John's the beloved, he's the only one that didn't die. Yeah, John got boiled in oil several times and didn't die. If I were John, I'm not so, I think John might be suffering the consequences of his arrogance in calling himself beloved. It's almost like he said, I'm the one Jesus loves, and Jesus went, hmm, okay. And there might have been a time after about that fourth boiling in oil that John went, can you please just take me now? You know, I don't know if you love me or not. Oh, I might have said that. But John, whiles, John winds up in exile. So he's not, he's not uh, martyred for his faith, which means killed for your faith. But they send him to the Isle of Patmos. And this is even seen, I've heard people talk about John was the beloved, he didn't have to die. He was able to die natural causes eventually on the Isle of Patmos. Doesn't that sound pretty? The Isle of Patmos. Anybody want to take a cruise to the Isle of Patmos? Well, actually today maybe, you know, I may be up for that, but, but here's something about the Isle of Patmos during when John was there. The Isle of Patmos was an island where they took all the criminally insane people that they felt bad to kill because they knew they were out of their minds and probably didn't know what they were doing. So they probably didn't understand right from wrong. They were just insane and just crazy, but they had done horrible things. They took them and they would go just drop them off on the Isle of Patmos. 
So here's how the beloved got to spend his last days. <laughs> we have this image of him just riding under a palm tree. John, oh, I saw Jesus. I was, I was in the, I was in the Lord. I was in the Spirit, and he starts writing Revelation. Let me tell you how John wrote Revelation. I was in the Spirit, <laughs> and. <laughs> I mean, you're living on an island full of crazy people. And I don't mean like some of you call it your home because you're like, I live with a crazy person. I mean literally crazy people. Aaron, Aaron, careful, Aaron, Aaron, be careful, be careful. I saw those out of the careful. Okay. John was literally living with insane people, criminally insane people. In other words, they had done something criminal and had to watch his back the entire time. Now, I suspect that when he was in the spirit, the Lord protected him and was able, he was able to write. I suspect that he probably didn't write Revelation looking over his shoulder. But that's the atmosphere he was in. So when you're in those moments, this is just a little sidestep. When you're in those moments and you feel like the world has gone crazy, it's gone mad, it's kind of whatever, God can take you to a place <laughs> that that can all just kind of go away. If he can speak Revelation to John on the Isle of Patmos, he can take care of you in the midst of your crazy. That was free. I don't even have that written down. <laughs> so John writes the revelation. Now understand, he's writing the revelation. He's saying, I saw Jesus. This is what Jesus looked like. I see Jesus. I see him. It's the revelation of who Jesus is. Now understand, Jesus is 100% God. He's God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God is eternal, right? Okay? And so God does not have a sense of time. God doesn't know time. Doesn't have this thing. I hate that this is your favorite old gospel spiritual. I hate, I don't want to burst your bubble. But he's not an on time God. He's God. Time is your problem. Our problem. So it seems to us like, oh, God was right on time. No, God was just God. We were the ones who consumed with time. God showed up when God was going to show up, when God always planned to show up, when he was going to be. He saw it. He was going to show up. It was it. it. To us, it feels like it was the last minute, God, and he showed up. No, God said, this is when I, this, this was the appointed time. So John is seeing a picture of Jesus, but he's seeing the past, the present, the future, and it's all at once. It's like all at the same time. It's, it's like... It's like one of those movies that I hate to watch. Like Inception and whatever. One thing like where you can't, you're, the whole time you're going, wait, I don't, I can't, I definitely can't see that in the theater. I have to watch it when it's on my TV so I can pause it and go, what, what happened here? Is this, are we, are we now? Or is this the, what's the one, there was one that came out right here in COVID and it came, they, they didn't even try to put the theater, they went straight to stream, you know. And it's one of those where the, it was like back in time, but it wasn't in time. But he written it was like a, he was a soldier. And he, I can't even remember what it was, but he, uh, the, I think Tennant was the director. But he, you know what I'm talking. You know what I'm talking about. And, and and I kept having to go wait. Wait, are we? Are we now? Are we in the past? Is it the the other past? Is it the? I I just. And to be fair, I can't, I can't I, that's why I can't do like Victor's favorite genre either. I, just, I can't do, so is it the ring, the, the ring, is it have the ring now? Are we still trying to return the ring? Does God have the ring? I don't. I tried to watch the first one of those at my brother's house. I was house sitting for him one time and he had the extended version. I didn't know what that meant. And I was three hours in, and I'm going looking at my son, going, "What? How long is this the same? Is this still one? Are we in two or three yet? Are we? This is still one. How do you sit through? I mean, it's four hours long. So I, listen, I can't even imagine what John was going through. God is revealing this to him, and he's seeing, and he's going, "Oh, that's oh, that's what happened. Wait, no, that's going to happen. Oh, no, that's happening right now. Okay, like, I don't." He had to be writing in the anointing of the Holy Spirit because I don't know how you wrap your head around some of this. All right. So let me just encourage you. When you read Revelation and somebody wants to roll out a bunch of charts showing you exactly when everything happens in Revelation, just walk, just run. 
And I say that. I've got some dear friends that love to do that. There are some prophetical parts that you can see in history. Okay, you can do that. There are times and seasons when Jesus tells us another time. I'm not making fun of any of that. But I'm, I'm telling you, just, you know, anytime anybody on TV says, oh, let me tell you something about Revelation. And just say, look, Perry, I, I can, you probably don't know. I know you've got a friend in Israel that you would, that would kill you if you told us his name. But, and I'm not making fun of him. God bless Perry. I, I, he's, he's mastered me many times. I'm just saying, that's not how, that's not how prophecy works. Okay. So that's, I, I could stand here for another 30 minutes and talk about revelation and misperception, but I'm not going to do that. Let's just jump right. This is towards the end of the book. Revelation 19. In chapter 19, John is seeing, again, I'm not going to try to even nail the time frame of this, but he is seeing, uh, most headings you'll see in chapter 19 say, Songs of Victory. This is the redeemed. This is the ones who have overcome. You know, we sing about that all the time. We have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We will overcome. So this is somewhat, I suspect, at the end. Not just because it's towards the end of the book. It's like three chapters from the end. But, but it's, he's seeing things that have, like when things are about to be over. Okay. And John says this in verse 6. Then I heard again what sounded like the shout of a vast crowd, or the roar of mighty ocean waves, or the crash of loud thunder. That I'll give you my opinion on what I think he heard here. John is hearing, and throughout the book of Revelation, you'll see John using simile. All right, English quiz. What's simile? Oh. All right. What's simile in Turkish? Obviously, I just trying to see if I knew that. Okay. Um, yeah, simile is when you use like or as. Metaphor is when you use, you just say like. Like if I said, Melinda, you're a rock. Well, that means you're solid, you're sperm, but I'm not calling you an actual. It's a metaphor. If I say, Melinda, you're like a rock. You're, that's simile. You understand the difference? You got it? So, these poor guys are going, dude, it's Sunday. Can we stay out of school for just a minute? <laughs> Sorry. So John used a simile all through Revelation. He's saying, I saw something like, I heard as if it seemed like because John is seeing things. Keep in mind where John's from and when he's writing this in, 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 what the, in the first century, barely in the first century, he's writing this and he's seeing things that are yet to happen and they're happening now. He's seeing those battles. Could you imagine somebody from the first century trying to describe an aircraft carrier group or an Apache helicopter? I think John does actually because he says, I see what it seemed like form, swarms of locusts. They were big locusts. Okay, I, I suspect that John was seeing things that he couldn't even wrap his head around. So here he says, I heard what sounded like the shout of a vast crowd or the roar of a mighty ocean waves or the sound of thunder. Now we've talked here, I've talked to you before about frequencies, okay? Earlier in the service today, you heard some of those. They were coming out, they were reproducing quicker than we could handle, and it got through the system and it went woo, because it was like, it was a specific frequency, okay? Frequencies are like tones. They're like, they go from lower than you can even, that you can just feel, you can never feel. If you ever drive up next to Melinda and she's got the windows all rolled up and whatever, you can feel her frequencies. <laughs> Those low frequencies, they, they're big and they go through everything. So all you hear is, mm -hmm. <laughs> you hear, you can hear that. You can hear that. I could have easily said Aaron in his new ride, but I know. <laughs> um, so, like we, 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 you can feel the frequencies. Okay, low. The higher they get, the higher pitch they get, to the point that they're they're just they're just that, that that's a frequency. It's it's inaudible. Both the low end and the high they're over. But if you put them all together and you play them all at once. Okay, every frequency at one time 
the sound you will hear sounds like this. You ever, back before things were digital, so this side, you, you got, most of you won't even know what I'm talking about. Do you remember when TV, you had to put tinfoil on the antenna to try to, and you were trying to tune in something, and, and the, the screen would just look like static and snow? What was the sound you heard? Yeah, because you were hearing every frequency all at once. That, that there's no tone to it. There's no whatever. It's, it's known in the, in the audio world as white noise. White noise. Um, that's what John heard. Listen to what he says. I heard the roar of a mighty ocean waves. Or, or thunder, or a vast crowd. It was, he heard. I believe he heard the overcome, the redeemed, because then he begins to describe the song they were singing. But in heaven, is, or I assume where John is looking at, he's seeing people that are completely um, in a new body, like Jesus, means perfect. So now we are limited. Our, our vocal cords are limited. They will only reproduce certain frequencies. But when you are able to just do like Jesus, I mean, Jesus walked through walls, he did whatever, I mean, you're just, you, you're perfect, you do whatever you want, you're not limited anymore which means he heard people singing in every frequency. Everything. But John didn't know how to say that. John says, it sounded like the ocean, like thunder, like a vast crowd, like it just, it, it sounded like all of you, when I was trying to play a video for you to pay attention to, and all y'all were talking so loud, and I looked at Zoe and said, turn that up, I don't think they understand there's a video playing. And she did, and y'all got louder and louder and louder. <laughs> And all I could hear was, oh, no, 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 no. you're all talking. And it's wonderful. I love to hear the fellowship. It's wonderful. But John heard that and said, I know. And this is what he said. This is what they sang. So at some point, you can understand the words. They said, praise the Lord. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice. Let us give honor to him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb. And his bride has prepared herself. Now they're talking about themselves because who's the bride of Christ? We are. That's how the scriptures refer to us. He is the bridegroom. There's going to be a marriage feast where he is going to bring him to himself. It's a little awkward for some of us dudes to call ourselves the bride, but that's what we are. It's a, we're the bride of Christ. And this is what they're singing. They're still singing here. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear. For the fine linen, now, now notice here, the quotes stop there. So John is singing, here's the song, praise the Lord, for the Lord, our God Almighty reigns. That's actually a song. Hallelujah, for the Lord, our God, the Almighty reigns. And then he picks up verse seven, let us rejoice and be glad. I mean, be glad and rejoice and give the glory, honor unto him. That's a song I grew up singing. Okay. And he says, for the time has come for the wedding feast. And the bride has been given the purest of fine white linen to wear, end quote. That's the song. Then John, through the only the Holy Spirit, says this. For the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's people. Notice he doesn't say the fine linen represents the great faith of God's people. Now, I would argue it actually does represent the faithfulness of God's people. But how does John know? Because he can see the good deeds of God's people. That's what the white linen represents. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words. These are true words that come from God. Verse 10, this is John, then I fell down at his feet, this angel, to worship him. But he said, no, don't worship me. I am a servant of God, just like you and your brothers and sisters who testify about their faith in Jesus. Here's how I know that the deeds he saw represented in the white linen represented the faith of the people of Jesus. He's saying to him, I see you. I'm just like you. Don't bow down to me. I'm a servant just like you and your brothers and sisters who testify. How did they testify of, of the faith of Jesus because they were dressed in white linen which represented the deeds. 
And he says to him, worship only God. For, listen to this statement, for the essence of prophecy is to give clear witness for Jesus. Mm -hmm. The essence of prophecy is to give clear witness for Jesus. Now, the word prophecy there is the Greek word propheteia, which looks like prophecy almost. But what it means is a declaration, a representative declaration of the mind, will, or knowledge of God. So prophecy, when I was talking earlier, I said prophecy is more than just those things. It is all of those things. Those things are wonderful. But prophecy is simply a representative declaration of the will, the heart, the mind, the knowledge of God, who he is. It is speaking the word of God. Can I tell you this based on what John is saying here and what the angel is saying to him? The greatest action, the greatest works that can ever accompany our faith is to give a clear witness for Jesus. That's the angel. The angel identifies it for us. He says the works. And see, I think if we're not careful, we can look at that. They got white linen brought. I've heard people preach, oh, he's coming for a bride that's got white linen. That means you better be doing stuff for Jesus. Okay, yes. But, but we almost turn that into some workspace to where we got to do this stuff. I don't think you have to do anything. I think you will do everything. Because it doesn't, you don't do things for him for his love you do things for him out of a heart of love but what the angel says is the greatest thing you could ever do is to be a clear witness for him is to point people to him that in itself he says that's the essence of knowing the heart the will the mind of god that is the essence so let me tell you faith should always be Faith should always speak the heart, the will, the mind of God. It should always point people to Jesus. And here's the problem. If you feel like I've got good works, I'm doing good things, so I'm going to be okay. It might be that the good things are fruit of a heart relationship, but you can do things hands and feet without it ever hitting here or here. And this is the important part. And the greatest thing you could ever do, the greatest action you could do, is to give a clear witness of Jesus. So are the things you're doing pointing people to Jesus? It's probably evidence of the fact that you have a real faith that has made it from here to here. And more importantly, this, this passage for me right here, that statement, okay, completely destroys one of the greatest myths that ever existed. One of the greatest lies that is told in our culture today. Here, you want to know the lie? Here it is. Your faith is a private matter. That's a lie. Faith is not a private matter. Faith should not be private. Faith, faith that isn't public is useless. If I can paraphrase James. That's what he's saying. Faith without work. Faith that doesn't reveal itself, that doesn't show in some way it's not a prayer. Now, faith does not, it doesn't mean that your faith should represent itself in a 10-pound King James Bible that you beat people over the head with. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a life that lives for Christ, that represents for him. Now, Paul tells us, you need to have an answer. You need to have words. I love St. Francis, what he said. St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel as often as you can and use words when necessary. Can I addend that? You will always need words. At some point, you're going to need words. He's saying that preaching should be your life, but at some point, you're going to need to be able to explain to somebody why it is that you're different, why it is that your works are, why it is that you are pointing to Jesus. So you should know you're going to do that, but it, 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 it's not private. It's something that should be public. This is how James ends that chapter, that little section. Verse 26. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. He says, this isn't optional. This isn't, hey, if you want to be a super Christian, you'll do some good stuff too. Or you might just say, oh, I believe in Jesus. No, he's saying, 
Just like the body needs breath. You can't live without breath. You can't, you can't do it. When, uh, when, when I decided to be a, a chaplain with the, the uh, Charlottesville Fire Department, the, the chief at the time brought me in and said, okay, well, you've got to go do some basic stuff. And I said, okay, is this going to be prayer stuff? Is this going to be, what is it, the stuff from the chaplain, right? He said, yeah, no, you're going to learn how to save somebody's life. You're going to have to stop bleeding. And I'm like, hey, oh, you yeah, know, hey. Yeah. But I did it, and it was enjoyable. And thank goodness he didn't make it. I didn't have to go through a class. I got, like, private instruction. It was great. It was good. I can't remember. Nick, you probably know the old guy that did it. I don't know if he's retired, or, but he was good. Uh, old EMT guy. Probably teaches it. And we'll talk later. I, I know you know it. Anyway. But Linda and this guy were in there with me, and they were kind of walking me through. And I had the dummy, and I had to do things. You know, I had to learn how to give people breath. Because that's the first thing. Well, it's one of the things, but, you know, doing the heart compressions and doing the things and stuff. Well, you can't live without breath. But here's the great thing about what James said. He says the body, just like the body without breath is dead, so is faith without works is dead. But the word he uses for breath is the same word that's used all through the New Testament for the spirit. He says, just as the body is dead without pneuma. So can I tell you, without the work and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, your faith is dead. It doesn't work. You need that action, that involvement. And I would say, more, more importantly, what would help you tremendously is not just to have the Holy Spirit, which happens when you accept Christ, but to be completely overflowed and baptized in the Holy Spirit. That takes you to a whole nother level. It gives you tools that are beyond. So if you want to live, if you want not for your faith not to be dead and not be useless, it needs to express itself in something, not by your efforts, that's what Paul was saying, but by natural and honest transformational works that come out of your expression of faith and love of Christ. It should change, you should look different. You should act different. Your actions should be different. You can believe here and still treat your wife like dirt. But when it gets to here, your actions are going to change. You're going to be different. You're going to change. Because faith without that reveals the fact that it's just a belief. You're, you're just on par with the demons in hell. They believe. So I want to encourage you today. That didn't sound very encouraging, but let me kind of try to make that somewhat encouraging. I want to encourage you today to, 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 make, to just take an assessment. We do this every week, but take an assessment and say, God, do I, do I just have a head knowledge of you? Do I just say I believe in you or has it really changed my heart? Has it really, am I, without even realizing it maybe, am I living kind of like James is describing when he describes something that's useless? I don't want to be useless. I, maybe some of you, anybody do? I want to be useless. Anybody today, nobody? Useless? Nobody sign up for useless? Jamie, no? No, you, you want to? Okay, what am I? Okay, good. So make sure. I think all of us want to be useful. We want something. To, to, we want it to mean something, right? Then pray today and say, God, I want this. Now, maybe, maybe some of you, some of you that are watching, listen, maybe you've not even got it to hear. Like, I don't know if I even believe it at all. So maybe today this first step is to say, hey, you know what? I, I think I actually do believe that, that Jesus died, that he rose again, that he died for me. And you need to make that confession of faith. Say, okay, I, I'm going to actually sign on. I'm going to believe. Once you do that, though, you need to do. You need to shema. You need to listen and obey and do what he says. Some of you have been listening for years. It's time to obey. It's time to put your faith into action. It's 
it's time to, and I'm going to use this carefully, I'm going to be careful. I started to say it and I hurt my brain. It's time to earn that white linen robe. Oh, we don't like the word earn. But it's, it's easy to earn. There's nothing to it. It's simply believing in him and then doing what he says. Doing what he says. And that will testify to the gift of grace that he has put in every one of your lives. And it will then point others to Jesus. As you give testimony, give witness to who he is and what he has done in your life. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for the gift of your son Jesus. Help us today to have a faith that is not just head and all belief, but it is faithful and trustworthy and it's assuring. Let our faith produce something. Let it produce a witness to you. Let it point to you. Lord, I thank you for those that right now are having finding the courage through the power of your Holy Spirit, through that the provenient act of your grace that is giving them the ability to actually make that prayer and repent and change their direction and say, I want to follow you. Forgive me, God, without you I'm a sinner. And I need you in my life. Lord, I pray for those that have made that confession of faith and they say, Lord, I, I want an empowerment that goes beyond just my natural ability. I need a supernatural empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray today that you will immerse me, that you will fill me and flood my life with the power of the Holy Spirit that I might have the tools necessary to have the power to give witness to Jesus, to who he is, to what he's done in my life, to the transformation that I've seen. And I would be that witness in my neighborhood and the surrounding counties and the state and the country and the world of who you are to me. Lord, we thank you for fulfilling and doing and answering the prayers of your people. 